Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom, and we are in Nehemiah today, talking about, I feel like, the discipline that none of us feels like we engage in adequately. <laughs> that is prayer. I don't think I've ever met anyone who's like, yeah, I, I really think I pray enough. <laughs> Yeah, as as an elder, when we ask how's your prayer and Bible reading, it's always could be better, and it's said with with bleak, pale expressions, and and so it's hard to know. Is this the everybody's? It could be better, or is this really? It could be a whole lot better. So it's hard to know sometimes. <laughs> they they beat us there, and so it's you know kind of rude to push and say, well, how 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 much better could it be? <laughs> Just to get back to the. The, the the normal that we all fail at, you know. But yeah, mm -hmm. this this is hard. Prayer is hard. And yet it is very important. That's why we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about it using Nehemiah. For people who do not know Nehemiah, it falls chronologically after Ezra, and I would argue after Esther as well, because we're going to see a queen on the throne, and the only queen we care about is Esther. <laughs> She's the only one who fits into biblical theology remotely. Anyway, uh, and and if it does fall after Esther, that explains in in part the opening, and, and it goes kind of like this. By the way, I'm going to recommend cataract surgery right up front because oh. um, I can read without my glasses. Hey, yeah, that's really nice. It, it is. I just have to find the right, you know, like they do in the TV shows, movies, just. Move the Bible in and out until I find the, the sweet spot. <laughs> Came to pass in the month Shislu in the 20th year that I was in Shushan, the palace, Susa, the Persian capital. <clears throat> that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that escaped, which were left of the captivity, concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnants that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, if this was what happened when Nebuchadnezzar took the city, this would hardly count as news. And Nehemiah's reaction would probably be like, so nothing's changed is what you're telling me. But he is he's terribly upset by this, as we're about to see, which suggests that this is the result of the war described, described mentioned barely, at the end of Esther. When Haman's plot allowed the Jews' enemies to legally attack them for a day, and this seems to be while well, they were attacking Jews all over the the empire, without a great deal of success, they also apparently tried to take out Jerusalem, and so word has reached that things are not going great there. The, the walls and the gates have been burned, so whatever success had been made since the return had been pushed back again, and so Nehemiah. Is greatly grieved over this. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. There's a bunch in there we probably should talk about for a second. First of all, he sits down. That's not the normal posture for prayer, hmm. which is to say that there is no required posture for prayer. Why do you sit down? Because he just got bad <laughs> news. <laughs> Ma'am, you need to sit down, right? I was just thinking about this for some reason, like last night. Why do we tell people to sit down? I think I was probably reading an uh, Agatha Christie mystery. Ma'am, you should sit down to hear. No, I want to sit. Why do we want to stand when someone tells us to sit? Anyway, mm -hmm. he he plops down and, and, and he, he, he weeps and he prays. He doesn't get on his knees. He'll do that on other occasions. But right now, he's just overwhelmed by this really, really bad news. And it doesn't just strike him then. He sat down, he sits down, he weeps and mourns certain days, that is, for quite a while. And he turns it, he moves it from simply an emotional reaction into religious pra practice. He fasts. That is, he goes without food and probably certain forms of drink and such for a while. We're not told how long. We know how long it takes him to form his plans and such. Uh, but he's he doesn't just sit there in an emotional mess he turns this emotional energy into something structured by God's regulations for, for worship. Fasting is a biblical thing. Common in the Old Testament, Jesus assumes we'll do it in the New Testament. We have records of Paul doing it. 
Uh, and so he's doing this, and he prays before the God of heaven. God of heaven, this is the Persian name for God. He doesn't say the Lord God of Israel, although that'd be fine, and he invokes covenant language in a bit. But in talking to the world, sometimes we use their their language. You know, the word God nowhere appears <laughs> in either the Hebrew or the Greek text of Scripture. You've got Elohim really? and you've got Theos. <laughs> you don't have God. That was an Anglo-Saxon edition. Oh, yeah. You mean the actual... The actual word. Yeah. Well, you know, there are yeah. people who are upset because Jehovah isn't exactly the right transliteration oh, of, yeah. uh, of the tetragrammaton. And then so yeah. they go for, for Yahweh. You know what? <laughs> no, when, when, when our Lord was on earth, no one ever called him Jesus. Right. They called him <laughs> yeah. Jesus, Yeshua, something like that. We have to yeah, be... Yeah, I think the, the only important time to know about why it's Jehovah versus Yahweh is when you're talking to Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes. You, you can tell them Jehovah is not in the Bible. <laughs> yes. So there, there, there is time to adapt to the language of the culture if you can do so without um, betraying the faith, betraying our, the Lord himself. It's mm -hmm. one thing to call Yeshua Jesus. It's another thing to call him I, I don't know, Elvis. It just, you know, there are things that don't work there. Mm -hmm. uh, he prayed before the God of heaven. Oh, and also the eye throughout this. We're going to find out eventually, probably not tonight. Well, it's kind of tonight because right here, this is also his prayer journal. There are numerous times throughout mm -hmm. where he stops mm -hmm. and records his prayers. So there's something else. Writing down our prayers in advance or after we've prayed them or so that we can go on praying the same prayer is a biblical thing. It's okay. You don't... Well, let me go a little further, and this will, this will come back to us, I think. Mm -hmm. I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven. So now he combines, uh, O Yahweh, Elohim, of whatever their word for heaven would have been, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy, chesed, covenant loving kindness, covenant mercies, for them that love him and observe his commandments. Now, he could have said those who trust in him, and that, of course, would be perfectly true. But he's focusing in on this connection between God fulfilling his covenant promises and the obedience he works in us. And this is, I'm sorry, tangent. This is something I've been dealing with in other contexts, so I want to kind of throw this out there for the moment. We all believe in justification by faith alone. I've been willing to die on that hill any number of times and got shot at a few times for being even on that hill. Having said that, faith, saving faith, true faith, does do things, do things. <laughs> it works. It repents. It seeks God. It loves. Faith that works by love, Paul says. It's not just, uh, yeah, I believe that. Now, what's next? No, it's it is a life-changing thing. It's the, the Bible calls it the fear of the Lord. And so it's the catechism, Heidelberg in this case, speaks it of as a, a certain knowledge and a hearty trust. Um, but out, so we're not adding things to that, but we're saying when that conviction that this is real, this is true, Jesus is God, Jesus is my Savior, and I am trusting him, second part, then trust looks like stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I trust a chair when I sit down in it. I, I trust um, someone writing me a check when I take it and say, thank you. Uh, trust means I'm committing myself to someone in certain actions, um, repentance among them. And here, he's he's drawing out this thing. God is faith. If God has worked obedience in us, then that's real faith, and God honors real faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God I think Jordan covenant. Peterson's on to something when he talks about believing in God being something that you act in terms of. Not that he has articulated necessarily <laughs> a biblical definition of faith, yeah. but he always, when someone asks him, so do you believe in God? He says, well, I act as though I believe in God. Like, <laughs> <laughs> meaning there are actions associated with this intellectual ascent, right? Yeah. Um, which... Like, if we can't say at least that, <laughs> I think we're yeah. in trouble. If our faith is not as great as Jordan Peterson's, then right. there's <laughs> some problems there. But, you know, we, like we, a few decades back, we had the 
Lord, the so-called lordship controversy. Mm, mm -hmm. Isn't it just enough to say you believe in Jesus, you know, to trust him, but that doesn't mean you really have to do anything, does it? I mean, that would be adding... And um, a number of people, Ken Gentry wrote on it, John MacArthur Jr. wrote on it, or two books, in fact. Uh, but it comes back every now and then, because we're always tempted to go off base, left or right, with regard to the truth, to fall on one side or the other. And someone could take this one verse and run with it and say, see, God honors people who keep his commandments. So if I want to be blessed, I have to keep his commandments. There's a sense in which that's true, but it's a very narrow sense. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the analogy I've used over the years is, if I want to give my daughter a bicycle, I will first of all be sure that she's tall enough to sit on it. And I will be sure that she's careful enough to not to ride immediately out into the road and get herself killed. And when, when she grows up in these areas, I will give her the bicycle. Has she earned it? No, I'm, I'm waiting to bless her with this. But sometimes things have to happen before the blessing is going to do what the blessing is aimed at doing. Yeah. And so time, sometimes God does not, God does not normally bless us with children until we're married. There are exceptions, there's adoption and such. But normally, for most people in most times, you want the blessing of children, then go get a spouse. Mm -hmm. But that's requiring me to do something. Can I just trust God? And, you know, <laughs> how about, okay, <laughs> can I just trust God for the spouse then and just wait until he shows up? Mm. You do at some work. point have to walk down an aisle and say, I do. Like, yeah. that's an action you have to take. And, and, and there might, are some other actions question, that lead up that to that burning? ability. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you might even have to walk across the room and say, "Hi, my name's Mary." Right, What's that's yours? the harder yeah. part. Right? Yeah, that's actually a lot harder. Uh, yep. or walk to your pastor and say, "Is there anyone you can introduce me to?" Ooh, that's really hard. But you know, mm -hmm. is God being stingy and holding back blessings? Are we having to work for those blessings? No, there are certain things that he he wants to bless us. He's promised to bless us. And when we've done all these things, we have not earned his blessing. Many, for instance, in this case, many young ladies have w walked across the way, spoken to Bob and said, my, my Mary, and have walked down the aisle and then gotten married and then the children don't come. Mm -hmm. And 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 they worry, is, has, is, have we failed God? Is he? Have I disobeyed God someplace? Is he not going to bless us? Have we not done enough to earn his blessing? I can guarantee you that's not the issue. Yeah. Um, he, there, there may be something going on that God's cooking up, but... It's not because you didn't do enough to earn this blessing. Mm -hmm. And 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 so anyway, this is in some ways this was a minor point, but it's a touchy spot for me right now. So mm -hmm. I thought I would talk about it. For them that love him and observe his commandments, let thine ear be now attentive. Well, he's saying, in effect, and I'm one of those, Lord. I I'm trusting you. I'm keeping a covenant with you. I love you. I'm observing your commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open. That thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. Okay, day and night. Apparently, he's praying the same prayer, mm -hmm. and he's praying it at least twice a day, which means he has a written prayer that he's praying. Now, a good part of the Christian family is, un is uncomfortable with that. There are people who will not even pray the Lord's Prayer because, well, repetitive. I didn't mm -hmm. write it. Therefore, it could not possibly be from the heart and could not be part of true gospel religion. Now, those are serious warnings we need to take to heart, those of us who have from occasion used a prayer book uh, or used the Lord's Prayer even. There is a danger in simply mouthing words without thinking about them. Mm -hmm. And yet the Bible is full of examples of people who said, prayed from the heart set prayers, prayers that they had written. In this case, he seems to be using more or less the same prayer day and night for some time, for a few months, in fact. So it's all right. The question is, do you mean it? Are you paying attention? Um, sometimes when I'm giving this lecture or one like it, to my class, I'll, I'll look over to one side and see some, usually some girl, because girls actually have pens and pencils, and guys may or may not. <laughs> uh, I'll say, um, may I have a pencil, please? And I'll keep on talking, and she'll suddenly get flustered. Oh, no, 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 you can find the pencil and hand it out. And I'll take it from her, and I'll turn to the class and say, did I have to say anything special to get this pencil? No, you just kind of ask her. And was I put specially? Oh, dear student, will you look upon my need now? And, and No, you just ask her. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I got it because <laughs> she knew I meant it. <laughs> and that's really all that she, she knew I meant it. She had one. She gave me one. It worked just fine. 
And if you want to go to the bathroom, you don't have to come up with new words every single time. <laughs> Just kind of pointing in that direction probably will do. So, it, so many synonyms for bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the water closet, the yeah. lavatory. <laughs> tree. Yes. <laughs> and we ran out real fast. Didn't yep, we? that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the idea that our words have to be new and fresh every single time. Is, is not in itself biblical. Now, sometimes they're going to be if you're about to fall off a building and you yell, Lord, save me, like Peter did when he's about to fall in the water. That's great. We're going to see one of those prayers shortly. But uh, saying the same prayer over and over is fine as long as you mean it and you're thinking about it. It doesn't have to be fancied up, although he may have fancied it up. We're not told. We're just told that he, he, he himself says, I'm praying this prayer day and night. Uh Let's see, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess, excuse me, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We've dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commanded by thy servant Moses. Wait! He had just listed himself among those who love God and keep his commandments. And now he says, but you know what? I haven't. My fathers haven't. Your people haven't. And, it's, and he's making it personal. I and my father's house of sin. We have dealt corruptly. He, this is not the rule. That sometimes the prophets get cast in of, Israel's corrupt. I'm doing what you told me to, but they're corrupt. No, no he's, <laughs> he's taking this on himself too, and presumably he means it. So we have, again, the, the certain tension of, I am among those who keep you, who love you and keep your commandments, and yet that has not stopped me from being someone who breaks your commandments and who needs your mercy. In fact, he had spoken up front of God's covenant mercies. Uh, the word that's rendered mercy, I assume, is chesed, it usually is. And it means this kind of covenant love that defers or turns away or ignores proper punishment to make way for grace and to provide good things for God's people. And so part of keeping God's commandments is confessing our sins. We're not keeping God's commandments. If, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. So part of keeping God's commandments is to turn to God and say, I have in fact sinned. Mm -hmm. and, and again, sometimes turning to other people and say, I have sinned against you. So this, this is part of covenant life. Anyway. He goes on, verse 8, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commanded thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and I will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. So he's appealing to Scripture. In fact, he's praying Scripture back at God, and this is always a good move to tell God, this is what you've said. I've been doing this with the Lord a lot lately, concerning the, this promise to Abraham, all nations blessed and all that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look at, I'm getting old and I'm looking at our world and saying, compared to 2,000 years ago, the world's pretty, pretty blessed. But things are not going well. God, where's your promise? You, you said this, you mean this, you're going to do something. Could you speed it up a little? <laughs> Can I please see some of this move a little further before I die? You know, I got, you know, maybe 10, 20 years, depending on God's time clock or whatever. But, and, 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 I'm, mm. and I'm quoting, and then there's a whole uh, Romans 11 thing about the salvation of Israel. I'm not sure I know what God means there, but I keep saying, God, you know what you mean here. Whatever this is, do this. Because I don't want to fail in my prayers because I don't understand. Mm -hmm. I, I did that for a long time. I just kind of put that on a back shelf because I wasn't sure exactly what it meant um, exegetically and eschatologically. Now I don't care. God, you, you made a promise of some sort here. It means something. So would you, would you please do this? And, and I believe God honors this. I don't know if he honors my attitude or not, but he, he, <laughs> honors, he honors his word most certainly. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's quoting from Deuteronomy, and, and remember, he's already mentioned Moses. So he's rooting what he's doing in, not only in the Davidic covenant, but more so in the Mosaic covenant, because God, back in Deuteronomy 28, had said, if you sin, I will scatter you among the nations. If you repent, I will call you back. And so it sounds like a really applicable passage 
One of the things about this passage is that Nehemiah is not strictly speaking a prophet. He's not hearing God's word in his head or in any kind of audible voice. So he's he's doing good Bible study. He's saying, this is what your word says. It seems totally applicable to this situation. So I'm going to pray it back to you and claim it for this situation. And yet he's not dictating to God. He says, I think this is what you want, and I'm going to pray this. Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants that, who desire to fear thy name. We, we want to... We, we are trying to obey you, and we want to obey you more, and we want you to hear us, you know, if, if, it, was, if it was simple as name it and claim it. He's already done that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. he's, he goes beyond that. It's, we want to get this right. We want to fear you. We want to honor you. We want to do what you want. So please make up the gap here. We know that Paul says that when our words fail, the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered. He also, I think, tweaks the prayer. Okay, what they're saying <laughs> is this. What they mean, <laughs> what they want, what they would be satisfied, deliriously satisfied with is this. So let's, let's, let's do this. Um, o Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And of course, everyone reading this for the first time says, what man? Who? What? <laughs> Where'd this guy come from? Who is this guy? For I was the king's cupbearer. Oh, that's heavy emphasis. Yeah. Ooh, right yeah. at the end, sneaking it in there before the section break. And you know, all of the chapter breaks are something we invented. There is, there is a, a real section break here because it came to pass in the month Nisan. Now, we've gone from Chislu to Nisan, and I forget the exact number. I think that's four months difference. So this is not, and it's important for what follows. Uh, he has been sad, and he has been weeping, and he has been fasting, and he has been praying, but the shock of the news is worn off a long time ago. It's as he prays and considers the ramifications that the tears renew themselves. So this is not him walking in, having just heard this news. I know growing up, I just kind of assumed that because I wasn't reading the text. I was hearing people tell me what was going on. Uh, four months is significant. Four month, in four months, you can get over being sad if you want to. The sadness here that we're about to see is calculated. Came to pass in the month of Nisan. It's the first month of the year. It's Passover month. In the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, the wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king, meaning he tasted it to make sure it wasn't poisoned. <clears throat> so he has a, a high security position. He's trusted. He's known. It is not has not been uncommon in the ancient and evil, even the medieval world, for kings to hire outside their people uh, security agents. Uh, the Swiss Guard, for instance, were in demand everywhere. Vikings were used all over the place because all they care about is who, pay, who's, who pays them. They're not interested in promoting this family's interest or that client's interest. Just pay them well, and they're going to be absolutely loyal to you. And so... Um, the emperor, the Persian emperor, has a Jewish cupbearer, figuring he's as committed to me as to anybody. And also expendable. And expendable if things go badly. <laughs> I took up the wine and, and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. It was considered such a privilege, joy, to be in the presence of the king, who was one step from the gods, that anybody who came there should be elated, excited, smiling, beaming with joy and, pl and pleasure of the privilege. And um, although uh, Nehemiah probably didn't take it that strongly as such, we come in before our Lord, the God of heaven, on a regular basis, and we often come sad. So, But he had, he had been careful to play the game. He said, I, haven't been, I had not been sad before in his presence. Which means at this point, he goes in deliberately looking sad. He's playing the odds. He's trusting God. And, I, and wait, are you, talking, are you talking chance? You're talking province? Yes. <laughs> because this is the time to remind ourselves again, sort of like Esther, but perhaps less so, that he has not heard a, a divine prophecy. He's not heard a voice in his head or out of the sky. Uh, he doesn't know the end of the story. He does not know the end of the story. He does not know that he's the one who's been chosen to do this. 
in a sense, any more than Esther did. Esther could have been beheaded for entering into the throne room of Hazareris. And in, in my ordering of the chronology, this is the same king. So he has a little bit of background. The man's not totally unreasonable. He does regard friendship and loyalties and such. Still, is this a good day? Is this the right time? And notice the queen is there. That's part of his plan here, which again suggests who the queen has to be because to make it even. Because as far as the text goes, she doesn't say anything. And yet we're told <laughs> she's there. It's unusual for the queen even to be there. But Nehemiah deliberately chose a day when she would be there. So he is doing everything he can to provide a framework in which God may work. And yet he's got to realize that this may not be it. Maybe he has come to the throne room for a time such as this, and maybe he's got it all wrong. Or maybe God will use this some other way, and it may cost him his life to, for that way to work its way out. He does not know. But he does know that as far as human reckoning is concerned, he's got the best chance. He's, he's got the ear of the king, the queen, if it is Esther, apparently has not done anything or maybe has not heard the news. So it's, it's him. There's no one else. There's no other one representing Israel who has as good a shot at this. And he's thought it out and he's planned it out. We're going to see that more clearly as we go. But it's still, will he's been praying. And, he's, and he says, thy servants. He's got other people praying with him. Well, if one person prays, isn't that enough? Well, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> God encourages us to pray as a body and to pray for one another. Well, if you get more prayers, does it work better? It's it's, it's not that. <laughs> the, the work better is a bad place for prayer. <laughs> the Sorry. the more people praying at the same time, the more prairie it is. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm getting. Yeah. <laughs> prairie. It's louder for God to hear. <laughs> right, because he might be on the on the bathroom. <laughs> yes. Okay. In this the is lavatory not, at the yeah, water. Yeah, he closet. is not Bale, who who needs such facilities. Um and so I guess we do have to stop and, and consider this. Why is it that God sometimes responds to the prayer of one and sometimes waits to respond to the prayers of the whole church over time? I have an answer, but before I suggest, and I don't, honestly, I've never taught on this before, but I, I think I have an idea. But do you have any suggestions first? Well, the support that we give to one another when we ask for prayers and when we say, yes, I will pray for you and then pray for that person. <laughs> it's it's a, a way that God ministers to the body through one mm -hmm. another. That's That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're all members of a body. And if the head is doing one thing and the body another, it doesn't <laughs> work very well. Um, you get into traffic accidents that way. You get into traffic accidents, <laughs> exactly. But if you bring in more people, essentially, and, and say, look, this is something. Not only that, it, it's, it's a way for all of you to rejoice in the goodness of God mm -hmm. together yeah. in the same and to thing. do what Christ is doing, as you said, the head. Yes, mm -hmm. I caught mm -hmm. that. Because Christ prays for us. Mm -hmm. and he I, I, us I forget which him. Puritan says it, but he, he says, like, if I could hear Christ praying in the room next to me, I would not fear a thousand enemies. And yet, distance makes no difference, and he yes. prays for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> exactly. You know, well, that's your answers were more or less what I was going to say. Uh, it is a chance for God, an opportunity for God to spread the blessing around as we all together learn to support uh, one another in our weaknesses, in our needs, in our fears, and, and to rejoice in our, in our successes and our blessings. Uh, God could certainly respond to the prayer of one and, and often does, but sometimes he wants to be heard by a lot of people, or he wants to hear a lot of people, so that there is this sense of unity. So it is the body praying. So the, as you say, we are imitating our Lord. So, yeah, thank you. You said what I was going to say and, and more beyond that. So, that now. So, here he is. Here's Nehemiah in the courtroom, the throne room. And uh, he's sad. And the king says, Where, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. 
Well, this is exactly what Nehemiah wanted him to notice. Mm -hmm. And he did. And Nehemiah's response is, then I was very sore afraid. Because <laughs> he can hear the tone. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, the, the emperor is, is just a seconds away from whistling for the executioner. Because this, this is a capital offense. It is a mm -hmm. slap in the face of the emperor not to rejoice in his presence. And the, the emperor's look at him long enough to say, no, this is not sickness. This is something else. He, he, would, he would cut him slack for sickness. He likes Nehemiah, apparently. But deliberately being sad, you know, if, this, if, if you can't come in here, your, your dog just died or worse, your wife, then you should have sent a note and got an <laughs> excuse. You should not yeah. be here. So this, this, is, this is something that is potentially very rude and insulting. And this reminds me of, I don't know, maybe this is tangential, but the way tolerance today doesn't mean tolerating someone. It means affirming that person's choices mm. and identity no matter what with 100% yeah. vocal support silence is violence it's not enough to yeah. simply accept that a person exists you know it it's putting oneself in the role of this emperor like it's <laughs> entering into that mindset of excuse me i am the sun and moon and stars yeah <laughs> And, uh, but, but he does ask, he doesn't just throw him to the lions or whatever. He actually asks him. And so Nehemiah replies, I said unto the king, let the king live forever, which is an honest prayer request. And it's one that only Christians can make. Mm -hmm. Speaking of resurrection life, why should not my countenance be sad when the city the place of my father's sepulchers lieth waste, and the gates there are, are consumed with fire. And again, this suggests that this is new. This is news. This is something recent, because it was 70 years ago, this, or more at this point. That would not be justification. He would have been sad every single day. So this is obviously he's gotten some new report, new information. And at our school, we'd say, so he has, he's making an appeal. Okay, what is your new information? <laughs> I just found out that. Right. And so the king looks at him and says, for what dost thou make request? <laughs> what would you like me to do about yeah. this? <laughs> what, what, yeah, what's he, at this point, and again, this king shows us all that although he can at times be naive, he's not an idiot. And he's able to read the situation. He, if this is um, Darius the Great, then he's a general with lots of skill and practice, tactics, strategy, all of that. And even if whoever he is, he's he's running an empire. He's normally, he can pick up on things. So at this point, he's probably saying, oh, so you deliberately took a chance here. That was gutsy. And you deliberately offended me. Okay. Kudos for that one, I think. So that means you've got something really specific you can think back of the, again, if this is the same king, we could think back to his response to Esther. Okay, Esther, enough is enough. What do you what want? What do you want? <laughs> Tell me this time. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's something going on and I don't know it and I'm the emperor and I think I ought to know it. So what do you got? What's, what's this all about? Lay, lay it out for me. And Nehemiah says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, he didn't have time to thumb through a prayer book. There was, at my previous school, there was a gentleman who filled in for uh, one of our lit classes. He was a, a pastor of a church that uses a prayer book, let us say. And he began every session of class with a prayer from the prayer book for, the, for that day, which is fine and good and all. But I think there are times when the students would have appreciated a prayer for their grades and for the test they were about to take. <laughs> but he seemed that that was the only way he knew how to pray. Maybe I'm misreading the situation, but that's kind of the impression the kids got anyway. <laughs> But, you know, there are times when you don't have time for that. And when you're running through the uh, respective uh, prayers in the book, you may not find one that exactly fits this situation. <laughs> prayers when velociraptors are poking their nose through the electric fence. I don't, you know, there's something equivalent, I'm sure, but it might take you a while to process it. He's got seconds. Uh, on this, By the same token, though, he does not get down on his knees and raise his hands to heaven 
Oh, Lord God, as I stand, as I kneel here before this man who has great authority, and I know that you love him and you love his people and you have great plans for him, would you please write? He doesn't do any of that nonsense because it would be nonsense right now. He probably doesn't say anything out loud. If he does, it's under his breath. Probably it's just in his heart and his mind. He prays. And it's probably something simple like, Lord, help me, Mm -hmm. Uh, which is always a good prayer. I learned a long time ago that anytime someone comes to me and says, Greg, Mr. Edinger, I have a question for you. You know, that tone. It's not a question of, you know, uh, fried eggs or scrambled. It's something bigger that my first response has for years now has been to pray to the God of heaven, (laughs) to immediately say, Lord, give me wisdom here. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I don't, a few times that I forget, it's not always great. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he prays and then he answers. He said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, and again, there's absolutely no reference, or no reason for that, unless it's the queen we know. For how long shall thy journey be? When wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. In other words, during those last four months, he had been planning. He'd he'd learned enough of how bureaucracy works, that he had registered for all the appropriate, um, they would call them firmans in the Middle East today, uh, permits, we would call them, uh, vouchers, um, what whatever, all the paperwork, all the task maps, all the agendas, everything is filled out, filed, and and ready to go. He's he's got a schedule. He's got it all down. Now you can contrast this with um, Ezra, who really didn't have much of anything planned. There's there's one point in particular we're going to see where Nehemiah has already learned from Ezra's mistakes. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let the letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come to Judah. So he's planning on how to get there and asking for imperial support along the way. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertaineth to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon him. Then came I to the governors beyond the river and gave him the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains with the army and horsemen with me. Ezra hadn't asked for for military support. And as they got together and were about to leave, he said, "Uh uh-oh. And he was afraid to go back because he'd already told the king, well, you know, God protects his people when they're doing this well. <laughs> oh, okay. I guess you don't need those soldiers. Never mind. Well, I, uh, which is not the time to explain the intricacies of human responsibility, and divine sovereignty <laughs> to someone who doesn't even know your God yet. Mm-hmm. So he had just contended to, to pray and ask God for protection and God had graciously granted it. But Nehemiah, having learned from that, decides, no, we're asking for a military guard. We're asking to be able to check in at every place along the way where there's imperial presence and uh, for letters to make sure they they support our mission. He's got everything nailed down. He's that kind of guy. He's the kind of guy that you you want when you're undertaking some big enterprise and you're just kicking it off. I've known one or two people like that. He's... They, they may not be good at everything, but when it comes to getting things going, I don't want their job, but they're great at it. <laughs> and Nehemiah was great. Nehemiah, though, is also great at at the long run of it, sustaining the mission, as we're going to see. Which is a reflection of his constancy in prayer, I think. Mm-hmm. I think there are so many, so many challenges to prayer that boil down to not following through over a long period of time. Like when, when at the end of a Bible study, somebody says any prayer requests, like I personally find it really hard to think of things that (laughs) are things that I would come back and, you know, the following week or whatever and have them ask me, so how is this going? And it's like, well, I don't really have an update. (laughs) Like this is a (laughs) long-term thing, you know? So it's kind of discouraging sometimes Mm -hmm. to ask for that kind of prayer when you don't really expect an update. 
Um, and how much more is it hard to continue myself in those prayers mm -hmm. for those things? Because I don't have somebody asking me every single day, hey, any prayer requests? <laughs> And there's there's the other side. You mentioned this earlier. People say, please pray for me about this. And we say, sure. Mm -hmm. And then we don't. Well, and then we don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's someplace else where I have learned to immediately, at least mm -hmm. in my heart and mind, pray at least right then. So yeah. I've done it at least once. Mm -hmm. The odds of me remembering, if I don't write it down, are not good. Um, I, have, I have people I have prayed for for 40 years. But sometimes they can't remember for something that someone asked me about yesterday. Uh, until they become a habit, it, it, it can be very hard. Mm -hmm. And um, we've seen that this is Nehemiah's prayer journal. It, 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 it is not amiss to write down prayer requests mm -hmm. and to keep track of them. We did that with our kids um, when they were really little. We didn't, <laughs> didn't follow through for too long, I uh. don't remember. But at least we started, and we we kept at it long enough to begin to check off some of the answers. And I think it was an encouragement to them, it was to me, I know. So, yeah, this this whole prayer thing, we start out by talking about how hard it is to be faithful. We've seen that Nehemiah did two things. One, he had a set prayer time, morning and evening, so twice a day. The psalmist speaks of three times a day. Nice to pair and in perhaps the watches at the meals, of the night. In the watches <laughs> of the night. And on my bed, you know, there's all kinds of times you can pray. But Nehemiah had it down to a schedule of morning and evening. And yet that did not keep him. When the emperor said, what do you want? Nehemiah did not think, well, I'm glad I prayed this morning. Don't have to worry about that right now. <laughs> no, he, <laughs> he, he jumped right in and prayed yet again. Spontaneous prayer without a prayer book. Wow. Um, Incredible. Me, yeah, and, and and God heard all of those prayers. He heard the prayers of everyone praying. He heard Nehemiah's prayer at the moment. Uh, and so we do need to, and this is, again, as an elder visiting people, this is something we hear. In fact, one, one of the last uh, young families we visited uh, said, you know, said the normal, well, we're not very good at this. You know, I, mean, I managed to pray in the morning and to pray at the evening, and most of the rest of my prayers are through the day whenever I need God's help, which is, you know, like a lot. I, I fail that to see what like your problem very healthy, here is. Very That's healthy. quite healthy. <laughs> yeah. His humility was wonderful. Um, it's, it's sort of like saying, oh, you know, I wish my gymnastics were better. I only got a 9.9. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd be happy with that. I, I, I have a prayer schedule, but it's sometimes a little rough to follow through. But I do. And, um, and our family has... Um, when the girls were younger and not gone all the time, we always prayed after supper. So we had a set time for prayer requests and all of that and Bible reading. And Kate and I have tried to pray before we go to bed. We do okay. Yeah, like everyone else, we do okay. I need to, I need to be better at, at leading that. Um, but throughout the day, yeah, that's actually, that one's easy for me. I talk to the Lord a lot through, during the day. Sometimes it's complaining. Sometimes it's help. <laughs> It needs to, there needs to be more thankfulness, honestly. Um, there, there's thankfulness for some things. I'm learning to thank God for all kinds of, you know, something that I, that I learned from our headmasters is to pray for safety and then to thank God mm. for safety. Mm -hmm. This is another oh, one of those yeah. things. Well, you know, safety, it's just, you know, it, it just is. No, it just isn't. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And uh, there's there's enough weird things in this world that I have learned to be very thankful when God brings everyone home safe. I'm usually the last one to go to bed at night. And part of that, not all of that by any means, but part of it is just, you know, wanting to just make sure all, as my mom would say, that all the chickens are home. <laughs> um, and, yeah, that, uh, that's definitely something that is a feature of our morning prayers, at least when I pray, is um, to say, Lord, please grant us safety as we go to and fro today. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm keenly aware living in a state that has snowy and icy winters of oh, yeah. danger on the roads. And we live in California, so there you go. It's <laughs> all kinds of things. Well, you, you, you have crazy people. Yeah, we have crazy people. Fires, earthquakes, yeah. crazy people, and no guns. Dogs allowed. and cats living together, mass hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So this um let, let us bring this in down then to what we see such a beautiful picture of in, in Nehemiah, the prayer and the work. Mm -hmm. He he does all of the preliminary work, 
trusting that this is probably what God has in mind, but not knowing for sure. There's no divine revelation. There's simply the general promises and commandments of Scripture. And then this is, again, the big thing about the Restoration Era. God's people are learning to walk by faith, and faith means reading the Bible, believing what it says, and then acting on it, which is where he kind of started all of this. And so he re he realizes, I'm in a unique position. I could I could be the pivot here, but God hasn't said so. No voices, no handwriting on the wall. Well, it's this important. Is it important enough to risk my life? Yes, it is. So on we go. And he does all of the work, praying all the time, getting other people to pray with him. And I think I said up front is that there are two sorts of Christians, I think, who have a problem with this. Um, the the hyper-Calvinist, let us call him for lack of a better word, who says, well, you know, prayer doesn't change anything. It's just uh, a way of meditating on God and his goodness because what's been ordained is ordained and it will happen. Okay, this is not Calvinism remotely. <laughs> well, it's certainly not biblical faith. God ordains the means as well as the ends. Nobody applies that to, so I won't go to work today because God's promised to feed me. I'm sure that a chicken will come, roasted chicken will come flying out of my mouth any minute now. <laughs> uh, we, we know in other areas that if we want X, if we want B, we have to do A. If we want C, we need to do A and B. Um, if we want the door open, we have to. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then we have the other person on the inside has to get up, be willing to open the door mm -hmm. and come and let us in and not shoot us. Um, yeah, that's, we, 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 somehow the theology does not get in our way in everything else when it comes to asking God for things that we can't do in our own strength. We, maybe we could begin the process or, or, or be a link in the chain, but we can't do it. We just kind of think, well, you know, if God wants it done, it's going to happen. God wants to save people, he'll save them. Um, I don't really need to talk to them. I'll pray for my coworkers, and it's kind of in God's hands. I mean, sure, I could walk over them and say, hey, you want to hear about Jesus? And they'd laugh at me, and that would be that. But that's not necessary, because if they're God's elect, Jesus died for them, they're going to be saved. It's so interesting how <laughs> so many things suddenly are not consistently held to when it comes to God. Yeah, this is so. And and sometimes I think the answer, yeah, we need at some point to do the systematics and dot all the I's and cross the T's. But sometimes it's just a question of reading the Bible a lot. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you hang out with people like Nehemiah and Ezra who prayed— and got answers, then you kind of learn to do that. And uh, one reason for not just, you know, turning to the catechism or the confession and saying, well, look, this is what it says. We want to see God's servants at work as God sees them. God, God picked up these men as examples, particularly here in Nehemiah, and, and shows us what a godly man praying for. He's not full of himself. He's not cocksure. He does not know where this is going. He is taking a huge risk, but he's operating off the information he has. I could make a difference. And not only I could, and hypothetically, I am the best person to make a difference given what I know, which knowledge may be imperfect and incomplete. So it is incumbent upon me to make the request, even though it means risking my life, because it's that. And notice notice all the ifs and the, the, the qualifications that I just threw in there. There's a lot of balancing here. Mm -hmm. What if what if he was not the king's cupbearer? What if he was the trash man? Would it have been such a good idea? What if his wife was pregnant with twins? Would this maybe be the time to risk his life? I don't know. You know, there's a lot. What if he uh, was not, what if he was only the second cupbearer? All of these what ifs, we have to balance. That's the responsibility of, yes, asking God and asking God to open ways and to make things plain, to give us opportunities. But it still requires some thinking and some planning and some weighing of options and and then work. He filled out all the forms. He was ready. When the king says, how long are you going to be gone? He has a timetable. He has he knows exactly who he needs permits for. He basically just needs to spin them around and say, please sign this, um, even though he wasn't sure any of it would work. So th this is great faith. The Heidelberg Catechism says this about the petitions in the Lord's Prayer. I'd just like to read them. 
in, in um, looking at two of the petitions, it says this. This is what these petitions mean. Grant that we and all men may renounce our own will and without murmuring obey thy will, which, on, which is only good, and that everyone may attend to and perform the duties of his station and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels do in heaven. That's thy will be done. And then this, I, guess, I assume this is uh, give us this day our daily bread. Be pleased to provide us with all things necessary for the body, that we may thereby acknowledge thee to be the only fountain of all good. Uh, neither our care nor industry nor even thy gifts can profit us without thy blessing. And therefore that we may withdraw our trust from all creatures, that would include ourselves, and place it alone in thee. And so we ask God for a good will, and then we ask him to bless our performance of that will. We, we, we want to know what God wants. And then as we do it, we ask him to bless it. And, and again, the, but wait, God knows everything. And here's the line from Narnia that we mentioned before. Sometimes he likes to be asked. <laughs> because God's not a slot machine. Mm -hmm. God is not, insert prayer, pull handle, get blessing. God's a person. He wants us to talk to him. He wants fellowship with his people. He wants us to know our own dependence, not simply in a meditative sense of, wow, I am really a needy creature. I'm, I'm coming to understand that. But in the personal communion and prayer conversation with him, as we ourselves in talking to him come to the realization and confession to him, I am so needy and you have everything. So prayer yeah. and work, no, no conflict. No, no confusion. Mm -hmm. We just like to make excuses, I think. Yeah. Psalm 37, 3 is trust in the Lord and do good. Yeah. So shall you uh, dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Mm -hmm. All, All right. right. Speaking of being fed, I have a recommendation. Okay, good. Go with your recommendation. Purple vegetables. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure if you've been in the market for carrots you've gone to any grocery store and found a five pound bag of carrots for like five dollars um Those and california numbers uh. <laughs> sure whatever <laughs> i don't know i'm just pulling it out of my head i'm pretty sure that's vaguely in the ballpark um but you probably don't go through five pounds of carrots all that often. No. But it's the best price because you buy in bulk and save, right? Right. I'm going to say do not buy in bulk and save because if you go to Trader Joe's, you can get the two pound bag of carrots and they're all different colors and mm. it is so much more fun. So much more. Like you get your money's worth in fun with these carrots. <laughs> Same with the, the rainbow <laughs> potatoes. Like the, everything you make with these vegetables that have the purple in them <laughs> is like 300% more fun. And you're more excited to eat it. And they're vegetables. So they're still <laughs> healthy. And so you're having fun eating vegetables. And does it get better than that? I don't think so. Does it turn you purple if you eat too many? Uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Get back. I I will I will second that as well because uh, last year when we were getting some stuff from the farmers market in town, uh, uh, multiple times, multiple weeks, we got. Um, I don't think they were officially like legally speaking ube <laughs> like mm. purple sweet potatoes, but they were sweet potatoes that were purple. Um, <laughs> And then also multicolored carrots, and we made curry with both of them, and it was just perfect mm. and so much fun and just like aesthetically pleasing in the bowl. Like it just worked. Uh, for my recommendation, I am like 99% certain that I've recommended this before just because it's me, it's this group of, of people who know each other. Um, but we're watching through it again right now, my wife and I. So I'm going to recommend Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Solid. Well, I was expecting you to say more, but I guess that sums it up. Um, <laughs> Avatar The Last Airbender <laughs> <enough said>. itself. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I guess. Yeah. Oh, um, we, maybe we should talk about how we as Christians can recommend something so steeped in <laughs> uh, pagan mysticism. Join us Go next ahead. episode for a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll put it. No, I mean, we can uh, talk about it now. I don't mind. Um, uh, no, we're, we're out of time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we are. 
<laughs> I'm just watching the clock here. Um, so I'm going to keep mine short. I have two recommendations. One is going back and reading Agatha Christie Mysteries that you haven't mm. read in 20 years because you probably have forgotten the solution. Unless <laughs> I mean, there are a couple that you, you're not going to forget because they're so special. Mm -hmm. I, I picked up two Mark, Miss Marple Mysteries that I, one, I was pretty sure I didn't remember very well. The other one, I thought, oh, I know this one. I don't remember it at all. I remember seeing a TV <laughs> version of it, but I'm not enough to know what's going on. So it's, and I'm reading it with more experience, having read all our other books. I was like, oh, oh this is making a whole lot more sense. We, and the murder just happened. Huh. The other thing I recommend is all of you people out there sending us recommendations <laughs> like yeah. today. Because we're trying to put together an episode based on recommendations, and we went yours. From listeners, yeah. From listeners. And we, we told our friends at Bible Study last night, and it was kind of, there was a little bit of confusion. What kind of recommendations? Like, yours? No, we went your own. <laughs> you, you, there are things you like to do. No, tell us your favorite recommendations that we've given you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, tell you us know, how that's... great we are. <laughs> okay, I wasn't going to go that way with it. But you know, if there's something that you liked and would like to elaborate on it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But surely there are, th we are you, you will have noticed that our interests are rather narrow. When you've gotten <laughs> gardening and books and old movies, you're, you're running. And food. Food. That's oh, pretty sorry, much all of our recommendations. Yeah, right pretty there. much. So um, feel free. Mm -hmm. uh, let us let us know, but soon, so we can we can make this more than just us filling time with the two or three recommendations we have already. So, thank yeah. you very um, much. This is also sort of in the uh, in the finishing up of this podcast. You know, we're in Nehemiah, which is close to close to approaching the four hundred silent years, which close out the Old Testament, and. Uh, that's that's going to be the end of halting towards Zion, <laughs> um, and we can all say, "Oh, oh, um, yeah." Um, there, we'll keep you posted. We've got other things in the in the hopper, as it were. Um, but yeah, we'd there's like the entire to finish. New Testament. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> what? But it's not halting Zion. Towards Zion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But in halting any case, within Zion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. If yeah. you've been listening to us or are listening right now as as a one off, that's, that's fine too. You're still a listener, and um, we would like to bring you into the process and enjoy the community of listeners that um, we are privileged to share. Speaking of you, listeners, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sending us your recommendations. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your financial support. If you are one of our supporters, thank you so much. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or become a patron at patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Big thank you to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. A uh, big thank you to our transcriptionist. Uh, if you would like to receive the transcripts of our episodes in your mailbox email box sorry we're not mailing them to you <laughs> in the in the snail mails that's not in the budget um, you can sign up to our sub stack uh, which is currently the only way to get our transcripts i think that's all of our end notes so gretchen's waving good night so i'll say good night friends <laughs> good night gretchen good night gretchen 